soothing story time. The Stampeding of Lady Bastable It would be rather nice if you would put Clovis up for another six days while I go up north to the McGregors, said Mrs. Sangrail sleepily across the breakfast table. It was her invariable plan to speak in a sleepy, comfortable voice whenever she was unusually keen about anything. It put people off their guard, and they frequently fell in with her wishes before they had realised that she was really asking for anything. Lady Bastable, however, was not so easily taken unawares. Possibly she knew that voice, and what it betokened. At any rate, she knew Clovis. She frowned at a piece of toast and ate it very slowly, as though she wished to convey the impression that the process hurt her more than it hurt the toast. But no extension of hospitality on Clovis's behalf rose to her lips. It would be a great convenience to me, pursued Mrs. Sangrail, abandoning the careless tone. I particularly don't want to take him to the McGregor's and it will only be for six days. It will seem longer, said Lady Bastable, dismally. The last time he stayed here for a week, I know, interrupted the other hastily, but that was nearly two years ago. He was younger then, but he hasn't improved, said her hostess. It's no use growing older if you only learn new ways of misbehaving yourself. Mrs. Sangrail was unable to argue the point. Since Clovis had reached the age of seventeen, she had never ceased to bewail his irresponsible waywardness to all her circle of acquaintances, and a polite scepticism would have greeted the slightest hint at a prospective reformation. She discarded the fruitless effort at cajolery and resorted to undisguised bribery. If you'll have him here for these six days, I'll cancel that outstanding bridge account. It was only for forty-nine shillings, but Lady Bastable loved shillings with a great, strong love. To lose money at bridge and not have to pay it was one of those rare experiences which gave the card table a glamour in her eyes, which it could 
never otherwise have possessed. Mrs. Sangrail was almost equally devoted to her card winnings, but the prospect of conveniently warehousing her offspring for six days and incidentally saving his railway fare to the north reconciled her to the sacrifice. When Clovis made a belated appearance at the breakfast table, the bargain had been struck. Just think, said Mrs. Sangrail sleepily, Lady Bastable has very kindly asked you to stay on here while I go to the McGregor's. Clovis said suitable things in a highly unsuitable manner and proceeded to make punitive expeditions among the breakfast dishes with a scowl on his face that would have driven the purr out of a peace conference. The arrangement that had been concluded behind his back was doubly distasteful to him. In the first place, he particularly wanted to teach the McGregor boys, who could well afford the knowledge, how to play poker patience. Secondly, the bastable catering was of the kind that is classified as a rude plenty, which Clovis translated as a plenty that gives rise to rude remarks. Watching him from behind, ostentatiously sleepy lids, his mother realised, in the light of long experience, that any rejoicing over the success of her manoeuvre would be distinctly premature. It was one thing to fit Clovis into a convenient niche of the domestic jigsaw puzzle. It was quite another matter to get him to stay there. Lady Bastable was wont to retire in state to the morning room immediately after breakfast and spend a quiet hour in skimming through the paper. They were there, so she might as well get their money's worth out of them. Politics did not greatly interest her, but she was obsessed with a favourite foreboding that one of these days there would be a great social upheaval in which everybody would be killed by everybody else. It will come sooner than we think, she would observe darkly, a mathematical expert of exceptionally high powers would have been puzzled to work out the approximate date from the slender and confusing groundwork which this assertion afforded. On this particular morning, the sight of Lady Bastable, enthroned among her papers, gave Clovis the hint toward which his mind had been groping all breakfast time. His mother had gone upstairs to supervise packing operations, and he was alone on the ground floor with his hostess and the servants, 
The latter was a key to the situation. Bursting wildly into the kitchen quarters, Clovis screamed a frantic, though strictly non-committal summons. Poor Lady Bustable, in the morning room, oh quick! The next moment, the butler, cook, page boy, two or three maids, and a gardener who happened to be in one of the outer kitchens, were following in a hot scurry after Clovis as he headed back for the morning room. Lady Bastable was roused from the world of newspaper lore by hearing a Japanese scream in the hall go down with a crash. Then the door leading from the hall flew open and her young guest tore madly through the room, shrieking at her in passing. The Jacquerie, they're on us, and dashed like an escaping hawk out through the French window. A scared mob of servants burst in on his heels. The gardener, still clutching the sickle which he had been trimming hedges, and the impetus of their headlong haste carried them slipping and sliding over the smooth parquet flooring towards the chair where their mistress sat in panic-stricken amazement. If she had had a moment granted her for reflection, she would have behaved, as she afterwards explained, with considerable dignity. It was probably the sickle which decided her. But anyway, she followed the lead that Clovis had given her through the French window and ran well and far across the lawn before the eyes of her astonished retainers. Lost dignity is not a possession which can be restored at a moment's notice, and both Lady Bastable and the butler found the process of returning to normal conditions almost as painful as a slow recovery from drowning. A jacquerie, even if carried out with the most respectful of intentions, cannot fail to leave some traces of embarrassment behind it. By lunchtime, however, Decorum had reasserted itself with enhanced rigour as a natural rebound from its recent overthrow, and the meal was served in a frigid stateliness that might have been famed on a Byzantine model. Halfway through its duration, Mrs. Sangrail was solemnly presented with an envelope lying on a silver salver. It contained a cheque for forty-nine shillings. The McGregor boys learned how to play poker patience after all. And they could afford to. The End